True Horror is a choose-your-own-path horror audio game and is available on the Apple and Android store. By purchasing the app, you get the full exclusive game with 10 choose-your-own-path horror audio stories. With your support, you can help me turn it into a series. Now enjoy the show. Hey friends, I shall be gone this week for a wedding, but in my stead I will be featuring some of my favorite lesser-known narrators. Please show them your love and support, and I shall see you all next week. Dear Mr. X, During one of your live stream events, you asked me to tell you a story. I'd like to keep my real name a secret. So please, call me Dorian. The subject matter I'm about to discuss is of a very sensitive nature, as I work mostly with unnatural death. I've dealt with thousands of cases over the years. I'm one of the people who bag and remove human bodies and remains from crime scenes and other locations where people have died. I told you I have lots of stories, but I'll just start with one. Unfortunately, the stories I share with you will always be 100% true. This one is not the nastiest or craziest I've ever encountered, but it was disturbing enough to stick with me over the past year. I think about it pretty often. Last summer I got called out of my already busy schedule to collect the remains of a dead lady in a small trailer park. The home was out in the desert, extremely rural and sparsely populated. It was nearly a hundred degrees when I arrived. As I pulled up to the scene, I could see the police officers and some likely family members standing outside in the sun. That sight alone was enough to assure me that something horrendous was awaiting me inside something no one else was willing to even be near. As I got out of my vehicle, I forced the most solemn expression I could manage, walking past the bystanders without a single word. One of the cops followed, letting me through the back gate to show me where the deceased could be found. The first thing I noticed was that there was junk everywhere, piles and stacks of garbage, odds and ends. Butted up against the front windows, I could see cheap plastic bins full to bursting. Newspapers, chairs, and all kinds of things packed in together formed solid walls and pillars. This individual was a certified hoarder. The officer filled me in on some of the details as we walked around back. The lady was approximately 60 years old. I don't know how long she lived in the trailer but it was long enough for her to completely fill it with mountains of trash. It was so full that she could no longer live inside and had been living out on her back patio for a long time. Even that, her tiny living space, was eventually inundated with haphazardly stacked garbage that towered almost to the tin roof of the mobile home. The story was that one night, she was walking around one of her many junk piles, naked for some reason and one of them shifted and collapsed on top of her. She was pinned underneath a pile of trash, unable to free herself, but she wasn't seriously injured. Now, she did have an adult son and daughter who came and checked on her just about every day, but this is where the story gets truly messed up. When they found her, naked, half buried and pinned under the mass of garbage, for some reason they never tried to dig their mother out. They never called 911. They were even perfectly capable of moving the trash little by little and getting her out of there. But yet there I was, getting ready to remove her body from its unsettling resting place. What the hell happened here? Suddenly, the smell hit me. A full-on assault on my senses caused my eyes to water a bit as I drew nearer to her location. I could hear a distant but heavy buzzing coming from the collapsed wall of garbage on the patio. This poor woman's wispy, frail arms were somewhat outstretched. Countless flies crusted the area immediately around her waist, receding into the trash pile. She looked sick, pale. Her face was pressed down into the floor in a way no conscious person could tolerate. I grabbed onto her hands and gave a slight pull to see if I'd be able to get her out. To my surprise, her body slid out with ease, exposing a million new flies and sending a second, even more devastating wave of pungent odor into the air. The flies were so thick that I had to concentrate on keeping my mouth shut, even with my light particle mask on. 
for fear of one getting into my mouth. When the flies cleared, I could see that the reason she came out so easily was that the entire lower half of her body was smeared with a mixture of feces and fly larvae. I maneuvered her body up onto my gurney when her legs fell open, causing a writhing mass of maggots to roll out from between her thighs that made me take a step back, almost losing my grip on her. I could see that there were multiple generations of maggots living on and inside her genital area. That was when I realized that there were absolutely no signs of injury or decomposition that could be seen on her body, leaving me to speculate on how she actually died. She certainly appeared to be sick, but I could also tell that she only just recently passed. Another one of the cops finally told me the rest of the poor woman's story. For some reason, rather than get help for their mother, her children decided to just come over every day and bring her food and water. They did this for six god-awful months before she finally passed away and they called the police to report the death. The cause of death wasn't suffocation, dehydration or injury, but infection. I'm sure I don't have to spell out why that was the case. Even though it's been over a year, I still find myself wondering how someone could do such a thing to their own mother. I wonder if they even understood that what they were doing was killing her. I can't imagine the feeling of being pinned down for months, covered in my own waist as thousands of tiny parasites slowly eat their way into my body. It is a true example of a living nightmare. I want to thank you for listening to my story, Mr. X. Please feel free to call me if you have any questions or need me to elaborate on anything. Like I said, there are a thousand more stories where that came from. Sincerely, Dorian My name is Drew. I'm a former Marine, infantry. I live with my wife Cheryl and her son from a previous marriage. The little guy's name is Tommy. I met Cheryl when her son was about three years old and I've been with them ever since. Tommy and I get along great. He even calls me dad. He's seven now and even though I'm not his biological father, he's pretty much my son at this point. We have our quaint little home on the outskirts of town, living a pretty quiet life most days, but you know I wouldn't be talking to you if there wasn't some sort of trouble. Imagine a 37-year-old man who lives in his mother's basement in Ohio. He's got a 9-year-old son with an estranged ex-wife who can't stand him. He recently got himself into trouble by attempting to remove the boy from school one morning. He went into the main office to ask for his son but was confronted by school personnel who knew that he wasn't allowed to do so because of a restraining order. Before they could call the police, the guy stormed out of the office and sped off in his dilapidated old sedan. This guy is Joey, Cheryl's ex-husband and Tommy's biological father. I guess at some point after his divorce from my wife, he fell on hard times and decided to move up north to stay with his mother. No shame in that, of course unless you happen to actually be a crappy person. We have a bit of history together, but only through a mutual friend named Chuck. If it weren't for Cheryl keeping a picture of Joey's face around just so Tommy knew who his father was, I would have forgotten him by now. A couple of months ago, Tommy got very sick and had to go to the hospital for several days. I was so tied up with work that I was only able to spend time with him a couple hours per day with Cheryl basically living there with him. Luckily, my job makes me enough money to provide so that she doesn't have to work and can focus on raising our son and maintaining the household. On the third or fourth day Tommy was laid up, I was getting off my shift and headed to the hospital to see him. When I got there, I walked into the room and found Joey sitting next to the bed, talking to Tommy. He was visibly startled and quickly got up without saying a word to me. I simply stood there, staring him down in my own subdued version of shock as he scooted past me and out the door. For some reason, I didn't stop him. A couple of minutes later, Cheryl came in with some food from the cafeteria, having no idea that Joey was in the state of Florida, let alone that he had been secretly visiting our son in the hospital. When Tommy got released, 
We resumed life as normal, but that didn't last very long. Joey started showing up around our apartment complex, constantly trying to get us to buzz him in. At first, we tried our best, and I mean really tried, to give him the benefit of the doubt. He would come over wearing dirty clothes and had a really odd demeanor, like he was never actually sure where he was, but was playing a role of some kind. Even though I was put off by his slightly disheveled appearance and bizarre attitude, I still didn't want him cut out of his son's life. I tried to be nice, making small talk and asking him what he was doing back in Florida. Had he moved back for good? Did he find a job? Where was he staying? His eyes would shift around the room, looking everywhere but at me, while he clearly tried to conjure lies. He'd never give any straight answers and just mumbled. Eventually, though, his visits became a daily thing. He would constantly come to our door and ask to see the inside of his son's room. After a solid two weeks of that, which is more than most people would put up with, and definitely way more than any Marine I know, I finally told him to stop showing up unannounced, and we stopped buzzing him in through the vehicle gate. After that, he began parking his car illegally on the grass just outside the gate and walking in on foot. My wife would hear the doorbell ring, look out the peephole and see him standing there impatiently fidgeting around. I told her to just call the police from then on. The cops would show up and escort him off the property, and then he'd be gone for a day or two before he reappeared the exact same way. We'd call 911 again, and he'd be taken away. Wash. Rinse. Repeat. This happened more times than I can remember. He never got aggressive or anything. He was just always showing up. During all that time, Cheryl refused to believe that this guy was nuts. One day, I came home from work, buzzing myself into the gate, only to see him parked on the street outside in a car that was definitely not his. I stared him down for a few seconds before I pulled in. His eyes seemed to be fixated on the space just above the roof of my car. He would not look directly at me. I got a call from Chuck, our mutual friend, who told me that he was getting tired of Joey. Confused, I asked him to explain. Apparently Joey had been staying on Chuck's living room couch ever since he showed up in Florida. He told Chuck that he would only be there a few days, but it had already been almost two months. On top of all that, Joey borrowed a ladder from Chuck and hadn't returned it. My first thought when I heard that was the fact that I live on the second floor and my unit is at the corner of the building. And as you may have guessed, little Tommy's room has a window that faces outward and could easily be accessed via a ten-foot ladder if a crazy father happened to be in the area trying to kidnap his kid. The next morning at around 5.30 a.m., I woke up to the sound of my phone ringing. I picked it up, and it was the front gate buzzer. I immediately hung up, annoyed to the point where I had to calm myself down a bit. I decided to go outside and confront Joey, to make sure he knew that I'd had enough. I headed downstairs and into the parking area, knowing that Joey would likely be out there somewhere. The cool atmosphere of an otherwise serene morning was ruined. He was nowhere to be seen. I knew he had to be around there somewhere, so I kept looking. I passed by the mailboxes and was surprised to find Joey standing right in front of mine, trying to pry it open with his fingernails. He had this frustrated look on his face before his eyes shot up at me, startled. I asked him what he was doing, and he said he was just out for a walk. He also mentioned that he had just moved into the complex with his new wife, and he couldn't figure out how to check his mail. I almost wanted to believe his story for a second. Wow, congratulations. I didn't know you got married. What's your wife's name? I asked, already feeling suspicious. Thanks. Her name's Cheryl. She's 25 years old. You should really meet her, man. She's beautiful. Sweet girl. That's an interesting coincidence. The mysterious woman he referred to happened to have the same exact name and age of my wife his ex-wife. What unit are you guys in? I asked him, 
trying not to set him off. He gestured over toward my building. No way, I thought to myself. Hey man, it's pretty late, and you seem to be a little under the influence. Let me walk you home to make sure you don't hurt yourself. Oh, okay, sure. Thanks, bro. I had him lead me to the building and up the stairs, where he stopped at my door. He pulled a key out of his pocket and tried to insert it into my lock only to have this confused, sad look wipe over his face when it didn't turn. This is odd. This is my house. The key isn't working. Dude, this is my house. Cheryl and I have been living here for two years. You need to leave. Oh, oh okay. I'm, I'm sorry. This is the unit they sold us. I have to check with the office tomorrow and see if we can clear this up. I was totally creeped out, dumbfounded by how he seemed to genuinely believe what he was saying. It was clear that this man was, in his mind, at the place in life where he felt he was meant to be. My place. This guy thinks that he's me. Fed up. I finally called his mother, who Cheryl still had minor contact with, her being Tommy's grandmother of course. She told me that Joey was unemployed and had been staying with her for a few years in her basement. She also told me about Joey's attempt to pick up his estranged son from school, which nearly gave me a panic attack. This is where the nightmare really began. I immediately decided that we needed to make sure that Tommy's school knew not to release him to Joey. We went there to speak to the administrators, but we were informed that without a restraining order, Joey still had the legal right to pick up Tommy or withdraw him from school at any time. When we applied for one that afternoon, we were told that without a police report associated with our complaints, we wouldn't be able to obtain the restraining order. I never noticed it at the time, but whenever the police were called, they simply would take Joey away without writing up any paperwork, and that is what screwed us over. I heard my stomach hit the floor, knowing that at any time during the week, I might get a call from Cheryl saying that Joey picked up our son, my son, from his school. I knew that we would never see him again if that happened. A few days later while I was at work, an unrelated incident occurred and police were called. My boss, who I already told about my issues with Joey, spoke to the cops and asked them if they could give me some advice. I was able to speak to two police officers about the issues I was having. They both patiently listened to my entire story. One of them took notes in a small notebook while the other simply listened intently as if in deep thought. Once they heard the story, they gave me some advice about making absolutely sure that we got a police report the next time we called for Joey to be taken away. That way, we could at least start the process of obtaining a restraining order. They also gave me a stern warning against engaging with Joey if I saw him again. That wasn't a problem for me, but I knew I would have to convince my wife not to answer the door or his phone calls again. Having the word of the two cops, though, was enough to make her see that Joey was clearly a danger to us in more ways than one. Luckily for me, Joey still doesn't know where I work. I recently gave Chuck a call to vent about the whole mess of things that had been going on and he told me that Joey hadn't been back to his place for several days, something that he was totally happy about, being that having a nearly 40-year-old weirdo sleeping on your couch when you have a wife and two children can be problematic. As glad as he was to see Joey gone, it just makes me wonder every day, where the hell is he? So hey, Joey the kidnapping stalker who thinks he's me, let's never meet again. Greetings, friends. A year ago, I met a very interesting man who eventually became a good friend to me. Due to the sensitive nature of this story, I'll call him Chris to protect his identity. We both have a military background, so naturally, we spoke about some of our exploits in those past lives. He had an unexpectedly haunting story to tell, and when I later got this channel up and running, I asked him if I could share it with you. 
So here we go. This took place on an undisclosed military base, located in the damp jungles of a remote island. Chris says he remembers the wilderness being unnervingly quiet for at least a week leading up to the incident. The personnel stationed there chalked the silence up to a change in seasons or something. There had been reports of bizarre sightings, fast-moving animals no one could explain. Anyone who mentioned them was typically shut down with ridicule from fellow soldiers. The sightings were notably inconsistent with one another. Some saw large eyes. Others saw small ones. Some heard a big thing trudging boisterously through the undergrowth. Others heard the sounds of something sneaking around in the brush. However, no one had seen anything worth defending in the inevitable argument, let alone losing their reputation over Chris heard every report, due to the fact that he was the desk sergeant at the time. Anyone who saw or heard something off, which could potentially impact the security of the base, would typically come to him to have it notated in the log. He never took the more fantastical reports seriously enough to actually write them down, unbeknownst to the concerned soldiers who came to him. Some of them just came to talk about what happened, off the record anyway which would typically end up with them just trading ghost stories. On the night in question, Chris and his team were on the far side of the island, an area which is completely uninhabited, where no human presence could be found for several miles in every direction. For that reason, the military chose that location for storing their weapons and explosives. Chris and a partner, whom I'll call Barry, were conducting the nightly checks on the magazine storage areas which lay several miles deep into the uninhabited zone. The jungle was still weirdly quiet, but it was good for them, being that their mission was to detect foreign intelligence or other operatives tampering with U.S. equipment, or the occasional refugee group that washed ashore. They were on a road that rested in the valley of two mountains, bordered by gigantic hills, rocky and thick with tall grass. As they drove along slowly, with the windows of their Humvee rolled down, they heard a heavy thud coming from the woods, a totally unexpected, unnatural sound emanating clearly from the tangled growth. The first sound drew their attention, but was quickly followed up by other noises. Barry shut off the engine and headlights so that they could sneak up on whoever was out there. They knew anyone attempting to navigate the dense vegetation would have to do so carefully, taking time to avoid injury. But surprisingly, they could hear fast-paced walking, rustling through the tall grass. After a few moments, the sound began to move parallel to the road. They restarted the vehicle and began to pursue the noise. The walking continued for a while, as they followed it with only their running lights on, before it suddenly stopped. They at first thought that they'd lost track of whatever it was, so they turned the headlights back on, assuming it was just an animal and continued a ways down the road. As Barry proceeded to turn on the high beams, both men noticed something in the distance, approximately 30 yards ahead, a humanoid creature jumping into the road and then back into the brush on the other side. Chris said that it was gray, over two meters tall with a small oval head. Its movements were too swift for its size. The best way he could describe its leaping motion was like that of an impossibly nimble frog. Seeing the creature instantly gave Chris the feeling of being punched in the stomach. His heart sank so rapidly and his adrenaline kicked in so fast that he began to feel nauseous, on the verge of vomiting. He laments the fact that neither he nor his partner had the will to chase after the creature, but says that the feeling of being at such a disadvantage against a creature like that was absolutely petrifying. The idea that they were stalking it raised the question, were they hunting or being hunted themselves? Whatever it was, the monster definitely had the tactical advantages of both position and mobility. Chris and Barry turned their truck around and sped off into the night. The jungle remained silent for at least another week before returning to the normal droning sounds of the local wildlife. It's interesting that it's a known fact that many inhabitants of the jungle, crickets for example, are known to be very quiet in the presence of a stranger. Whatever that thing was, it was no friend of the jungle.
Dear Mr. X, it's me, Becca. We've spoken in the comments of your videos before. I was thinking about Randy's story, the one where an unexplainable cryptid appeared to try and take the place of his child. I believe that what he was dealing with may have been a mimic. I know it's sort of a bizarre coincidence, but I have heard of something like that before. In my research and experience, I find that cinnamon seems to work at warding off mimics. It worked for the family of a friend of mine, and that's actually the story I have for you today. This happened when I was a little girl back in the early 90s, maybe around 93. I had a friend named Sandy. She was an only child until the age of about four, when her sister Faye was born. One summer, when Sandy was about seven years old, her parents decided to take a cross-country road trip to Disney World in Florida. The family had a great time at the park, and as many of us know, the days went by in a blur. I guess the human mind can only take but so much childlike wonder and amazement before the memories start to run together. Before she knew it, Sandy and her family were packing up the minivan to head back home. After a few more days of driving, they finally made it home and unpacked their things, but something was wrong. Sandy noticed that somehow, there was no longer just one Faye, but two. She didn't trust either of them, getting a strange feeling that each of the three-year-old girls were aware of some hidden deception. Shortly after their return, Sandy's parents began going out and purchasing duplicates of clothing, furniture, and other items to accommodate the new addition to the family. I remember talking to Sandy, and both of us being confused about the whole thing, even with our young, normally carefree minds. For quite a while, Sandy's parents simply referred to both girls as Faye, but eventually, they took to calling one of them Kay, short for Kaylin. Now here's where the cinnamon came in. Sandy's mother used to make her favorite cookies, snickerdoodles. After Kay showed up, Sandy complained that her mom never made them anymore. As you may know, cinnamon is a key ingredient. In fact, any traces of cinnamon basically vanished from her house before we even noticed. One time when Kay was about four years old, the four of us were at a mutual friend's house eating cereal. Kay tried a piece of our friend's cereal that was flavored with cinnamon sugar. She quickly spat it out, saying that it was, quote, icky. However, as she recoiled and grimaced, I was watching her. I noticed that she began to undergo some extremely disturbing changes. Shortly after the food entered her mouth, her tongue and lips blackened, and there was a brief shift in texture to something less than human. It was as if her skin had become charred and burned, with the blackness spreading across her lower jaw and up to her nose, before retracting back to normal with frightening speed. The only reason I noticed it was because I was so distrustful of her. I usually found myself staring at her with a constant sense of suspicion. Faye, the original one, I think, had been eating the cereal by the handful. Kay started crying and knocked the cereal out of her sister's grasp making her wash her hands before dragging her back to their house down the street. Sandy's mother later forbade the children from visiting that house, based on something that Kay told her. We never found out what. The strangest part of all this is that Sandy's parents never acknowledged what happened. Not even once. The mysterious appearance of an extra child in their home. The clear lack of preparation that made them have to go out and buy duplicates of everything and countless other effects that come along with having one more child than you planned for. Kay had the mysterious ability to make her presence seem so unextraordinary. Eventually, I lost touch with Sandy and her bizarre family after a series of bitter fights and arguments between her and I. We basically ripped each other to shreds, emotionally. I didn't see them again until the late 90s when my brother died. For some reason, Kay had clearly developed an intense hatred of me. I found out that over the years, Faye had been constantly sick with flus and other maladies, but no one could figure out exactly why. Sandy finally moved away out of town when her parents divorced. So, as I said, I want to caution Randy on the acceptance of such a thing, he and his wife jokingly considering themselves to have three children instead of two. 
I would hate for them to end up like Sandy's parents, having one of their children truly mimicked, with no knowledge of which is the original one. What's even worse is that a mimic can tie its life force with its victim, and in that case, they really will have three children. Two normal ones, natural ones, and one that's secretly a demonic parasite with an extreme allergy to cinnamon. Anyway, thank you for listening, Mr. X. See you in the comments. Becca Dear Mr. X, it's me, Selena. I have a story for you. When I was around five or six years old, my family lived in a small two-story home near the outskirts of Omaha, Nebraska. Imagine if you were standing out in front, facing the house. You would see a lonely streetlight off to the left, and my room was on the right side, kind of sitting in the house's shadow. Before I explain what I saw, I have to give you a quick side note. The kids at my school used to say that my eyes turned red when I got angry, so they gave me a very hurtful nickname. One day, when I got home from school, I saw it written with markers on my bedroom window. Big jagged letters scrawled out the word, DEMON, across the glass. I couldn't believe someone went to so much trouble just to do that to me. They used a ladder we kept around back of the house. It hadn't been moved in ages and was covered with weeds and dirt, so it left muddy marks along the wall below my window. I got so mad that I hit the window with a rock and shattered it. My father had to cover it with a garbage bag and some duct tape. Anyway, it was a summer night, close to midnight when I got up to go to the bathroom. Despite it being so late, I was awake and full of energy, so I decided to sneak and play video games in my room. About an hour later, Around 1 a.m., out of nowhere I heard a faint scream coming from outside. I could tell it was a woman. Scared, but still curious, I ran downstairs to look out the window in the living room, but I was shocked when I realized that the whole room was bathed in red light. As I surveyed the surreal environment, it felt like an alien world, despite the fact that it was full of furniture and items I saw and enjoyed every day. I looked up to see that the windows were all covered, essentially plastered with some kind of paper-like material that seemed to be soaked in blood-red liquid. I ran back up to my room and carefully climbed up onto the sill, peering through the unbroken part of the window so as not to be noticed. What I saw, just at the edge of the circle of light on the street, was the shape of a man crouching over a woman who lay motionless on the ground. The man wore an orange, short-sleeved shirt and what looked like jeans, but the girl was dressed in a sort of business casual attire, a collared white shirt with a black skirt and stockings. I saw a streak of blue in her otherwise brown hair. The man looked up and his face was so pale that it stood in contrast against the darkness around him. A dark red smeared and stained his mouth and face. That's when I realized. I was looking at a vampire. As the shock and fear began to build in my young mind, he turned his head directly toward me with a startled look. He glared at me before sweeping the girl up from the ground and dashing away with such incredible speed, it didn't seem natural at all. I went back downstairs after he left and saw that the windows were back to normal. The next day, I went over to the spot where the attack had occurred and saw spots of blood on the pavement, along with a silver necklace. I took the necklace and cleaned it up. I still have it to this day. The crazy thing is, following the incident, I began to have nightmares of my hands being drenched in blood. Those soon evolved into dreams where everything in my house was splattered with it. My bed, the floor, the ceiling, and the walls. It was like I was living in some kind of slaughterhouse. A few days later, I woke up with a large bite mark on my arm. It was deep enough that it drew blood, so I showered and covered it up, doing my best to keep it hidden because I knew no one would believe me, and I already had a reputation for being a demon at my school. On top of that, I knew my mother would have thought I was cutting myself, and I just didn't want that trouble. 
I guess I was pretty stupid back then. I don't know what I saw, and I know I was very young, but I truly believe that man was a vampire. Please share my story, Mr. X. Maybe someone else has seen something like this. Dear Mr. X, it's me again, Tammy. Not long ago, I sent you a story about a haunting. I can't tell you how good it felt to be able to share my experience with people who wouldn't make me feel like an idiot or a liar. Well, I have another story I hope you'll find interesting. These events happened several years after I was haunted by May, the woman in the yellow dress. I may have mentioned this before, but both my parents had a long commute to work. My dad was in the army and managed to get my mom a position at the munitions depot near the post he was stationed at in Nevada. Eventually, they decided to find a sitter for my little brother and I that was much closer to the base. We were the youngest after all, so my parents wanted us not to be so far out of reach. We even went to school in the local area there thus avoiding the nearly non-existent education system in the small town where we lived. Our babysitter's name was Terry. She had a nice house, but it definitely stood out in her quaint little neighborhood. It was the only real house on the block, and it was obviously very old, built in a sort of colonial style that was popular so many decades ago. Most of the other townsfolk lived in either single or double wide trailer homes. Even more unusual, Terry's house was painted bubblegum pink. Being no stranger to the paranormal, even at nine years old, my sensitivity had grown since my last encounter. I began seeing shadows of people and hearing voices echoing down empty halls. My mother would instruct me to carry a blessed handkerchief and sing church songs out loud whenever I felt scared or threatened. When we first started being dropped off at Terry's house, everything was normal. We would go to school do our homework, eat snacks, play outside, kid stuff. My mom would pick us up in the afternoons. After a while though, I started noticing little anomalies happening every now and then. Small things like glasses of juice tipping over, chairs moving on their own, disembodied footsteps and thumping on hallway walls. My brother and I would sometimes even hear a woman crying. The first major event happened during Christmas time. I was given the role of the Virgin Mary in a nativity play for our church. I would also be singing. One morning, I was sitting in the kitchen with Terry and my brother, getting ready to practice one of my songs. It's important to note that this kitchen had a tiled ceiling. The moment I tried to start singing, the windows began to shake violently, briefly shocking me into silence. After a moment or two, I decided to continue since windows were known to shake a bit during windstorms that were common at that time of the year. When I opened my mouth to sing again, suddenly the ceiling tiles all fell down on us at once. Simultaneously, I heard a loud scream. I wasn't sure if it was Terry or my own voice. As the screaming faded away in my ears, I could hear my brother crying. We all sat there in a state of bewilderment for what seemed like minutes before Terry got up and led us out of the kitchen, carefully navigating the floor which was covered in ceramic shards. As soon as we crossed into the next room, I heard a sound that I couldn't describe if I tried. I turned around and saw all the tiles floating back up, replacing themselves exactly as they'd been before they fell. It was like the terrifying event had never even happened. After this, the little things kept on as usual with one exception. The woman's cries began to sound more and more clear, whereas before, it just sounded like muffled sobbing. I was able to gradually make out words. It was like she was begging someone. No. Please. Stop. I'm sorry. As time went on, we began to see the woman appearing in the house. The strange thing is that her presence was not in the least bit frightening. Whenever a glass would fall or a window would shake, she would be there standing over us. She radiated this warm, comforting energy. 
She had shoulder-length blonde hair. She was skinny with green eyes, appearing to be in her thirties. The sad thing was that sometimes she would appear to be beaten up. Her eyes swollen shut, lips split wide open, the side of her head sunken in and slumped over to one side. When she appeared to us, sometimes we would also see a man. He was an imposing figure, perhaps in his late thirties or early forties. He had pale white skin, with light brown hair and dark eyes filled with rage. His face seemed permanently trapped in a scowl, and the purest kind of malice emanated from him whenever he was there. I got the sense that he would have no qualms with hurting or even killing my brother and I if he had the chance, though I didn't know why. The weather in our part of the state was extreme at times. Bad storms were known to crop up out of nowhere and were often extremely dangerous. One day while I was at school, a storm hit that had the whole region scrambling to evacuate. The evacuation window was so narrow that I missed my bus due to my being in the bathroom when the announcement was made. My parents decided to have me stay with Terry until my dad could get away from his duties, preparing the military base to weather the storm. My little brother was already with my mom and they were on their way home, so I would be going to Terry's house alone for the first time. That made me a bit anxious because I had a bad feeling. The storm raged on until nighttime as I waited for my dad to come pick me up. At some point, I snuggled into the couch to relax. Terry was in another room. Now, this is the part where things got a bit fuzzy. I'm not sure whether the following took place in my dreams, or if I was in some kind of trance. All I know is that I don't remember falling asleep. This all just started happening. In the house around me, I began to see visions of a man and woman looking very happy. I could see that it was the same couple that appeared to us in the house. I'd never seen them looking so pleasant and full of life. The bright, loving pair carried boxes and furniture, setting them throughout the house as they seemed to enjoy a silent conversation between themselves. I couldn't hear or make out what they were saying. Before long though, Things took a turn toward a dark path that my childlike mind was not exactly prepared for. I began to see the man drinking from glass bottles and hitting the woman repeatedly. Time appeared to move on at an accelerated rate as the hitting and drinking continued over and over again. The woman stayed and stayed through it all. Even though she was clearly suffering, her injuries multiplied. I began to notice something odd. When the man moved, a liquid-like substance flew from his body, splattering and soaking into the walls like blood. It was as if the anger and hatred of his actions were taking a physical form and infusing into the very structure of the home whenever he raised his hand to strike his wife. At one point, he began beating her more fiercely than ever. Again, she begged him to stop. He didn't, or couldn't stop until she had died. Her waif-like frame crumpled to the ground in front of me. Realizing what he had done, the man wept over her for a moment, but somehow his sadness transformed back into anger, and he began kicking and stomping her skinny, broken body. For what felt like several more days, he continued to drink and wander around the house. The concentrated wrath oozed and dripped from his body, seeping into the floorboards and every surface he came into contact with. Eventually, he picked up her body and carried her into the master bedroom. He laid her on the bed before lying down next to her, and then he shot himself in the head. That gunshot was the first noise I had heard since the vision began. It snapped me out of it instantly. As I awoke, my dad was carrying me out to his car. My mind was preoccupied with this feeling that the man wanted to trap his wife, that he would do anything to make sure he wouldn't lose her. To tell you the truth, I didn't even completely comprehend what I had seen at the time. It's just my clear memory of the vision that makes me able to process it now with my adult mind. Weeks went by before I told my mom what had happened, what I had seen that day. After the incident with the lady in the yellow dress, she had no problem believing me. She got us a new sitter not long after that. I never went back to the pink house, nor have I seen Terry since that time. 
She always used to say that nothing strange happened in the house except when my brother and I were there. Anyway, thanks again for listening as always, Mr. X. Sincerely, Tammy. Greetings, friends. Before we get started today, a quick but important message for you. And uh, you'll have to excuse me because I'm, I'm away from my studio right now, training with my job. But I really wanted to get this story out to you as soon as I could. And, uh, an opportunity to record came up, so I'm taking it. Anyway, every so often I get a message regarding a creature or phenomenon that I've never heard of before. An encounter that is above and beyond most others. The beings encountered in this story have prompted me to create a new system of classifying the more obscure, unknown cryptids that I come across. From now on, when I feel the need to, I'll assign a class or a grade to a particular entity. What you're about to hear is the account of a pair of what I would call alpha-class cryptids. For lack of a better name, I've decided to refer to them as death merchants. You'll know why soon enough. Now, my friends, sit back and enjoy. This one is something else. Hey, Mr. X. My name is Lou. First off, I love your channel. It's so great that people have a place to share their stories. It's this community and the environment that you've created that has emboldened me to actually share my own life-altering experience with the unknown. I normally don't like to talk about it or anything for fear of what people would think, but if there's any place I'd find some level of compassion and understanding, it must be here, with you and the people who listen to you. So here goes. Several years ago, I was on my way home from work in the financial district of Lower Manhattan, New York, of course. I worked in an office building literally a block away from Wall Street. This was late 2011, around the time of those Occupy Wall Street protests in Zuccotti Park. The streets were packed with people wearing backpacks and headphones, carrying signs and megaphones. It was pretty much impossible not to bump into someone as you tried to navigate those narrow sidewalks. To be honest, the hassle wasn't anything special to me. I had my earbuds in with music playing to drown out the noises during my commute, just like any other day. I do consider myself a New Yorker, through and through after all. However, in order to get to the subway and back home to Queens, I had to either go around or right through Zuccotti Park, which did get a bit annoying after a while. Still, crowded streets are a part of our reality. Unfortunately, The same is true for the millions of homeless people taking refuge in the various nooks and crannies of the city. I'm not a saint or anything, but I do try to at least drop a bit of spare change in their cups every so often. I wish I could say it was every time, but it's not. I want to help when I can, but I'm embarrassed to say that sometimes I'm in such a rush that I don't even notice them there. I guess that makes me no different than the people who just breeze by the needy without giving the poor souls even a single glance. Sometimes it's as if the homeless are an invisible element in our cities, subsisting on the scraps left behind from those more well-off. I think that may be the reason why what happened that afternoon, right in the midst of crowds of people, was able to go unnoticed. I don't think anyone but me realized or even cared what was happening. The park was too crowded for me to walk through that day, so instead of trying to fight my way across to the subway, I decided to circle around and try a different stop in a quieter area. To get there, I cut into a side street that was significantly less busy. The moment I set foot there, I was struck with a feeling of heaviness and dread that instantly plunged my previously decent mood into an abyss. I couldn't understand why or where it was coming from, so I pulled out my earbuds and turned off my music, just to be safe. I felt that I needed my senses to be as sharp as possible for whatever danger I was sensing. As I tucked the earbuds away in my coat pocket, a pungent odor began to creep into my nose. 
It was the smell that hits you when you walk into a subway car that a homeless person has claimed as their permanent dwelling place. I looked ahead toward the corner of one of the buildings to see a surprisingly young man in torn up jeans and a hoodie. He had wild black hair and a long, unkempt beard. He rocked back and forth with a look of utter hopelessness etched into his face. He clutched a small cardboard sign that read, Help, please. Army vet. Lost everything. Just need forty dollars to get back home. There were very few people walking down that particular street, but there were enough passing through that he would occasionally pop out from his corner with his arms outstretched holding the sign, begging for the slightest bit of acknowledgement. It was quite a sad sight to behold. I felt terrible knowing that I had nothing on me to spare. As I got closer and closer to him, I felt terrible knowing that I had nothing on me to spare, so I would inevitably end up being one of those people myself, walking by him without seeming to care at all. Just as that thought crossed my mind, I saw an odd-looking man further down the road, walking toward the homeless guy. The strange man stopped and crouched down to the homeless one's level. After staring at him a moment, the stranger reached into his pocket and pulled out a large roll of cash, holding it out in front of him as if to offer it, but clearly holding something back. It was a bizarre sight, especially in New York City, but at least I no longer felt as guilty being unable to help the poor guy. I wish things went as you would expect from that point on, but unfortunately, that's where things began to get weird. To be honest, I've been building up this long preamble because every time I think back to this event, a sharp chill runs down my spine and I swear my eyes tear up. So as I continued to walk toward the pair, I realized that everything, like the world around me, began to slow down somehow. The loud noises of city streets faded into a soup of auditory blur. Every sound muffled as if I was holding my hands over my ears, or had my head under water. As this was happening, I realized I was staring at the strange man holding the wad of cash. I noticed how ordinary he was. Everything about him seemed so plain. He was dressed like any other white-collar worker. A simple, or even slightly ugly brown suit hung loosely on his slender frame. He wore a tie and dress shoes and carried a generic leather briefcase. He also had a matching brown hat on his head, angled in order to hide the top half of his face. As I slowly made my way closer to them, the stranger lifted his head to meet the confused gaze of the homeless man. That's when I stopped dead in my tracks. The formerly bland appearance of the man became clearer to me, and I noticed two haunting features. His skin was ashen white. Not paper white, but not quite gray either. And his eyes, they were a deeper black than I could ever describe. I tried my best to rationalize what I was seeing, but my brain just had a visceral reaction against it. A guy wearing black contacts in a business suit would be a little weird, but I'm sure it wouldn't be the first time someone had made those particular fashion choices out in NYC. I can tell you this, though. A regular guy dressed like that would not be enough to stop a New Yorker in their tracks like it did me. It was more than just the look of him. It was the feeling I got from him. It was like being punched in the chest. As a child, I dealt with frequent asthma attacks. And as an adult, I've had more than my share of panic attacks. But this was something else entirely. Much worse. A heavy, nauseating feeling that was born in the pit of my stomach and crawled up my chest before nesting in my throat. The air had become solid around me as I stood there, frozen. I could see in my peripheral vision that other people were still walking by through the side street although I somehow saw them moving in slow motion. After a few moments, the strange man and the homeless man's voices seemed to emerge from the muffled white noise of the rest of the city. Their voices slowly became clearer to me. I missed a lot of what was being said, but certain words stood out. I... I don't want to die. The words shuddered from the homeless man's mouth as he reached for the money. His eyes were fixed on the roll of cash yet steeped in hesitation and fear. The stranger smiled at him, and I swear to you, Mr. X, something about that smile made me want to scream. 
It was that moment I realized I couldn't scream even if I wanted to. I could do nothing but stand there helplessly, my feet nailed to the concrete sidewalk as the scene played out just a few yards in front of me. The stranger's response was chilling. Well, you're going to die either way, Robbie. At the mention of his name, Robbie sat straight up with a look of slack-jawed amazement, tinged with horror. A side note going forward, I'll refer to the man in the brown suit as Brown. This will be important in a few moments. So, before Robbie could say anything, Brown lifted his hand as if to give an important presentation and spoke again. His voice was just so wrong. I can only describe it as oily, gravelly, and wet, like someone trying to talk through a mouthful of phlegm. If you think the description sounds gross, just imagine how foul it made me feel hearing it. Question is... Do you want to die happy and comfortable, wanting nothing, or here, in this alley where no one will even notice until you've been rotting for a while? I still don't know how that scream didn't fly out of my mouth after what happened next. If I could have moved at all, I would have jumped right out of my skin. A third voice chimed in before the corresponding figure stepped into my view. Another strange man, nearly identical to Brown except taller, and somehow even thinner, and wearing a gray suit. I'll call this one Gray, for the sake of organization. Gray held a lit cigarette between two fingers and stared down at Robbie with a tired ambivalence. Take the money, Robert. We have things to do. Robbie nodded with a resigned expression as he took the cash. He gasped as he clawed at the bills, unfurling a surprising amount. This is so much, he exclaimed. I couldn't make out what was said next. I saw Brown stand up next to Gray, followed by Robbie standing and gathering his few possessions from the ground before thanking the two strange men, and then briskly walking toward me. He brushed past me in a hurry, thanking God over and over again, crying. I still couldn't move. I was stuck there as the two strangers' gazes fell upon me when Robbie was out of sight. The two sets of pitch-black eyes staring at me gave me the distinct feeling of being watched by something not human. Their mouths moved as if speaking to each other, but I couldn't make it out. The volume of the white noise around me was going crazy, up and down. It was extremely disorienting. Eventually I could hear a few bits of their conversation, but the language was unlike anything I'd ever heard. Now consider this. I speak fluent Spanish and understand bits of many other languages. Italian, French, Arabic, a little Japanese, and even some Yiddish. You tend to pick up little things here and there living in New York. I can certainly place a language roughly when I hear it. What the strangers were speaking was unlike anything I'd ever encountered. The sounds they were making weren't even sounds that people made. It actually caused me physical pain in my ears when I really began to hear it. Like when your ears want to pop on an airplane, the feeling when you know that there's pressure in there but you can't get it out, so it stings. The pain got so bad I wanted to vomit. Brown snarled a word at his friend in the same wet, nasty voice. English. Gray then made a bizarre clicking noise, smiling that same horrific smile that Brown did earlier. It'll be fine, Brown responded. Then why did you lie? What Brown said next still keeps me up some nights, even all these years later. He rolled his shoulders back and grunted. Uh, does it matter? I'll be wearing that stupid chip by the next moon. My eyes began to well with tears as I tried desperately to look away, but I was still paralyzed. Slowly the world began to creak back toward normal speed again. Mr. X, I'm telling you, I'm trying so hard not to cry as I sit here typing this. Just like the plight of Robbie or any other homeless person, 
No one bothered to even look at me as I stood there in terror. People were there, moving slower than normal, at least from my perspective, but no one stopped or noticed that I was in trouble. Gray looked directly at me. My head started swimming and I immediately felt dizzy. My vision blurred as I lost focus on all except one thing. Gray's voice. Um, well now, look what this one can do. Cute. Suddenly, Brown stepped forward from the sea of blur, his black-eyed face sneering at me from mere inches away. Whatever. A chimp is a chimp. They're all the same. Gray's voice grumbled at me. Hey, you, chimp, leave now. He snarled again, and I felt it in my bones. Keep walking. I wish I could tell you what happened next, but the next thing I knew, I was standing on the sidewalk all the way up at Columbus Circle in Midtown, almost a half hour's walk north of where I was. A man I didn't know was holding my shoulders as random people passed by with concerned looks on their faces. I was barely conscious. Once again, my vision was completely blurred out. When things slowly came back into focus, I could finally hear the man's voice. Yo, uh, you all right? He asked with a nervous tone. Damn near walked into traffic, man. You okay? Must be on drugs. Someone yelled out as they scooted by. I told the man I was okay as tears began to run freely down my face. I apologized and fled the scene as soon as I could, rushing over to the train station, having no idea how I got so far uptown. By the time I got home, I realized I wouldn't be able to tell anyone, not even my wife. She would definitely think I was losing my mind. I haven't seen those strange men, or whatever they were, since that day. I thank God for that. Over the years, I've done research into the paranormal to try to identify what they may have been, but I haven't found anything matching their description. I heard of black-eyed kids and black-eyed people, and the vibes people seem to get from them are somewhat similar to how I felt with brown and gray, but the situation overall was totally different. I don't know what I saw, and it still messes with me to this day. I've been to therapy about this. I've tried rationalizing and all kinds of other mental backflips, but no luck. Whatever the case, I can say that nowadays I can go about my daily life without thinking about that incident. Whenever I allow myself to reflect back on it, it seriously shakes me up. And I'm not immune to late nights of insomnia for fear of nightmares. I still question my own sanity every so often. Was this even real? After hearing some of the stories you tell on your channel, I wondered if anyone else might have seen something like this. So Mr. X, please share this story if you can. If anyone has had similar experiences, perhaps they can help explain what in the world I went through. It would mean so much to me if you could tell my story. Sincerely, Lou.